This presentation on interest rates discusses the term structure of interest rates, which as you can see from this picture is the relationship between the years to maturity of a bond and the yield to maturity of the bonds. So when the yield to maturity rises, with the years to maturity, then we have this green line, the, an upsloping yield curve. You can also call it upward sloping yield curve. If on the other hand, the yield to maturity, which is actually the market interest rates on the bond, drops with rising maturity, then we have this blue line, a down sloping yield curve or a downward sloping yield curve. What I show you here is what the yield curve was back on September 8th, 2011 in the peak of the Great Recession and you can see the term to maturity and the yield to maturity of U.S. government bonds. U.S. government bonds are called Treasury Securities or Treasury Bonds. So now keep in mind bonds with maturities of up to 12 months which is up to a year are zero coupon bonds. You can call them zeros and that's why coupon rate here is zero. Now longer term bonds uh, we, the eight immediate ones we call treasury notes and then the long-term ones are, are definitely called bonds. These are coupon paying bonds. So as you can see, this first column here are, show the coupon rates. The third column here shows the maturities of the bond and the final column here shows the price and the yield separated by a forward slash. So for example, this three-year bond with a coupon rate of 0.5% as of this September 8th, 2011, was due to mature, to mature August 15, 2014. This bond had a yield to maturity of 0.33% and the price was 116 and a quarter off the par value. Now, I show this example to say this. Sometimes bond prices can be expressed in conventional forms, as in the case for these UK government bonds, where you can see the prices are expressed in as a direct percent of par, so that this three-year bond here sold for 104% of the face value, yielding 0.63% but this three-year bond here notice how it's expressed so sometimes they're going to use a dash or a colon when you see that this extension here is in 30 seconds so this is actually 16.25 30 seconds or a or 100 in full 116 30 uh, 16 and a quarter 30 seconds so to find the actual dollar price you'd have to divide this 16 and a quarter by 32 and then add it to 100, you determine the percent of face value that this bond is selling for. Let me explain. My calculator is up here. So first, 16.25, I divide that by 32. So this is actually the decimal extension. And then I add it to 100. So it tells me that this bond is selling for 100.50781% of the face value. The face value is 100 is a thousand dollars sorry then you multiply uh, this by a thousand so to do so put this all in decimals by hitting the percent key so this bond is obviously selling for more than a hundred percent of the phase value so you multiply this by a thousand so for a phase value of a thousand dollars this bond is selling at a premium one thousand and five dollars and uh, point zero seven eight one three so you shouldn't be surprised because as you can see this three-year bond carries a coupon rate of 0.5 percent which is greater than the market interest rate of 0.33 percent since this bond pays you interest at a higher coupon rate than the yield to maturity the bond should definitely sell at a premium and in this case the dollar equivalent is 1005.07813 dollars so going back to the presentation, now actually what the yield curve, which is the pictorial rendering of the term structure of interest rate, is going to tell us is the difference in the maturities, in the yields of bonds with different maturities, having isolated their default risk, their liquidity, and their tax characteristics. And 
you can go to the web and look at I've given you a couple of websites here where you can check out current yield curve so let's go there All right this is on Yahoo Finance and this yield curve here is for US Treasury uh, bonds and which you can see down here as of um, uh, this current date of uh, uh, September 16th 2015 you see that uh, for these bonds with maturities from three months all the way to 30 year these are their corresponding yields right here and so when you plot these two columns you're gonna find this upward sloping yield curve you can also see the yields for municipal bonds and for corporate bonds by the way you can construct the yield curve using munis or municipal bonds or corporates as in corporate bonds if you want to but you have to isolate their mature their default uh, risks for example if you want to use corporate bonds then choose to stay with either single a bonds or stay with double a bonds or stay with triple a bonds the highest quality corporate bonds you can't mix and match because if you mix and match then you can't tell whether the difference in the yield that you're observing here is on account of their maturities or on account of their default risk characteristics you can also go to Bloomberg on Bloomberg hover your cursor over markets now if the site changes roll with it all right hover it over markets and then hover move it over to rates and bonds click on it and you will see this all right and in fact when you go back to uh, rates and bonds you just hover it on rates and bonds and move it to US bonds to find what it is for US securities and you can see here that for US securities again we have the maturities we have the coupon rates and again keep in mind up to 12 months these are gonna be zero coupon uh, bonds and then you have the coupon rates for the Treasury notes and bonds then these are the prices now these prices are expressed in conventional forms so that for this five-year bond here the price is 98.8984% of the face value and the corresponding yield to maturity is 1.61%. Surely you're not surprised to see this yield to maturity of 1.61% which is greater than the coupon rate because for this bond to sell at a discount which it is since it is selling at below 100% of par it has to be the it has to be true that the rate at which it pays you interest which is the coupon rate would have to be less than the prevailing market interest rates which is called the yield to maturity and then you can also go to fidelity sites to read up on a little bit more about um, yield curves so headed heading back to the presentation why do we have different shapes of the yield curve which as you can see can be upsloping downsloping or flat actually these are the three different theories that help to explain the different shapes of the yield curve now the expectations theory uh, expectations theory which I discuss here argues that the shape of the yield curve indicates the level or the expected level of future short-term interest rates arguing that bonds of different maturities are perfect substitutes imagine that what does this mean it means that interest rates on a long-term bond will equal the average of the short-term interest rates expected over the life of that long-term bond if you didn't get it I'm about to um, expound on it for example suppose that short-term interest rates are expected to be 5% on average over the next three years what the expectations theory argues is that what the three-year bond interest rate would be would be the average of five percent as well so here's an example which explains this quite well so suppose that one-year bond yield is nine percent let's say that one year from today the interest rate on a one-year bond 1R1 is 11 percent the expectations theory would argue that the observed two-year bond R2 the spot rates on a two-year bond would have to be 
the average of those two rates, which is 10%. In other words, the two-year bond yield is the average of the one-year interest rates plus the one-year forward rate on a one-year bond, which we are, for the pur for purposes of this simple example, are uh, is uh, 11%. And I'm going to show you how to determine this 11% by backtracking. So to illustrate. The expectations theory says if the one-year bond yield is 9% and the one-year bond yield we expect to prevail one year from today is 11%, then today what the two-year interest rates would be is 10%, which is the average of these two guys right here. In general, let's say that the one-year interest rate projected over the next five years are, are shown here. This first 5% is the spot rate, R1, which we can observe right now. This 6% would have to be 1R1, which is the one-year bond rate expected one year from today. That's it right here. This 7% would be the one-year bond rate we expect to prevail two years from today. And likewise, 8% would be the one-year forward rate expected three years from today, and 9% would be the one-year forward rate expected to prevail four years from today. So what this is telling us is that if we want to find what the two-year bond rate is quoted today, it should be 5.5%, which is the average of the one-year rate and the one-year rate we expect one year from today, because these two periods here if we average their rates, would give us the two-year bond yield of 5.5%. In the same vein, we can find the five-year bond yields to be 7%, which is the average of these one one-year bond rates, of which the first is a, is a spot rate, and the rest of them are one-year forward interest rates. So, with that logic, Why do we have differences in the shape of the yield curve? According to the expectations theory, when, the, when short-term interest rates are expected to rise in the future, then the average of future short-term rates would be greater than today's short-term interest rates. In other words, if I go back one slide, if you observe, today's spot rate is 5%. To find the two-year bond yield, we had to take the average of the one-year interest rates for the f first one-year bond and the second one-year bond over here. You see it's 5.5 percent. Look over here, continuing all the way to the five-year bond, bond yield, it's 7 percent. So as you can see, the average of the rates are increasing from 5 to 5.5 all the way to 7 percent. And the expectations theory is saying that that's because we're expecting interest rates to rise in the future. And that's why the average of these future short-term interest rates are greater than, the, than today's short-term interest rates. As a result, the yield curve would be upward sloping, as is, show, as is shown here, suggesting the likelihood of a rise in short-term interest rates and therefore a pickup in economic activity. Okay, I got a little presumptuous right here, but you should know where I'm headed with that. Now, obviously, the reason, if I go back again, that we're expecting short-term interest rates to be higher and higher and higher as we move along the years can only be because we're expecting economic activities to rise. Remember, the Fed would raise short-term interest rates, or at least the target for short-term interest rates, if they expect a pickup in economic activity as a way to contain inflation. Going forward again, go back to go down to three. If on the other hand, short-term interest rates are expected to fall in the future, then the average of the short-term rates would be less than what they are today. And as a result, yield curve, the yield curve would be downward sloping, which would suggest a likelihood of a decline in short-term interest rates, and therefore a likely slowdown in economic activity. As you recall, the Fed would tend to reduce their target for short-term interest rates as a way to boost Economic, uh, to boost investments and keep the economy humming along. So 
we're going to illustrate those uh, that very important point about the um, long-term interest rates being the average of short-term interest rates. So to illustrate, let's say you have a two-year time horizon and you have a choice between investing in directly in a two-year bond and holding it to maturity, which is right here on this picture all right, you buy a two-year bond, this bond pays you 10%. So you know you're going to earn 10% per annum for two years. Or two, you want to write the yield curve. And here's how you're going to write it. First, you're going to invest in a one-year bond, which as you know, pays 9%. And then when it matures, after one year, you reinvest in another one-year bond. Over here, where my mouse is flowing along, to satisfy your two-year horizon. Now, the expectations theory says it doesn't matter which route you go, you're going to wind up with a cent penny in the pocket. So, if because this, the, this one year forward rate here is going to be a rate such that you're going to wind up with the same future value at the end of two years. Therefore, if the expectations theory is correct, your expected wealth should be the same regardless of the strategy you choose. Now, as a pointer, your actual wealth may turn out to be different if interest rates change unexpectedly. So, I've given you a couple of examples here to buttress this point. And this picture here says, suppose you have a four-year investment horizon. You could invest in a four-year bond right now paying 5% or you can ride the yield curve by first investing in a three-year bond whose yield is 4% and thereafter investing in a one-year bond. Now though, we don't know what the rate here would be, which is R3, uh, R1. Three years from today, the rate on a one-year bond. We don't really know what it would be. But based on the expectations theory, we can backtrack and find what it is. Because today in the market, we can observe the four-year bond the interest rate on, on the four-year bond and let's say it's five percent we can also observe the interest rate on a four-year bond and let's say it's four percent I'm gonna pause for a quick second and go back to the web and go right here these are observed rates these are the rates the spot interest rates for the different maturities and that's what these are the rate on the four-year bond rate on a three-year bond but we can't see this but we can get it we can backtrack and get it using the arguments of the expectations theory because the compound factor for a four-year bond can be expressed as, as the compound factor for the three-year bond multiplied by the compound factor for the remaining one-year bond which is three or one and as a reminder, this is the algebra rule we learned in grammar school. x to the fourth is equal to x to the third multiplied by x. I've put to the power of one here, which is really muted, but I put it there to remind you that it's three plus one will give you four. That's the rule. So by substituting in the values and solving, we find that three years from today, the rate on a one-year bond should be 8.06 percent. This is called the one-year forward rate expected to prevail three years from today. So to find that rate in a direct way from an investment standpoint, say you have 10,000 to invest for four years and we have determined the four-year rate to be 5 percent. The future value of this is 12,000 and change as shown here. If on the other hand you wish to ride the yield curve, first you want to kick it up for three years and the rate on that is 4%. Now you, the future value of your money three years from now would be as shown here 11,248.64. Now what should be the rate if you were to reinvest this for one extra year shown here to earn this 12,155.0625? I go back, the future value at the end of four years at 5% if you were to go it direct, uh, direct. If you solve for R, 
that should come out to be 8.06%. So this is your PV, your FV, and for the one year, which if I go back here, is this one year period here, going back forward, it comes out to be 8.06%. And here's another example. Again, four years to invest. You can go four years and earn 5%, or you can ride the yield curve in a different kind of way. Here, you want to invest for just in a one-year bond, which pays 3%, and afterward, invest in a three-year bond. So one year from today, what would be the rate on the three-year bond? One or three? according to the expectations theory should come out to be 5.675 and again the compound factor for four years should equal the compound factor for one year multiplied by the compound factor for three years and that's the basic algebra rule right there adding these two you get four and once again if we went for four years direct this is going to be our future value but if you wish to write the yield curve and invest for one year at three percent this is the future value after one year at three percent now the question is what would be the rate of return we would earn if we were to invest this ten thousand three hundred dollars for three years to receive twelve thousand one fifty five point zero six two five at the end of uh, that process which again this 12,155.025, if I go back here, is the future value for four years at 5% if we were to go outright. If we solve for it, you are going to get the same thing that you would have gotten, 5.675, if you were to use the algebra rule to get it. So finally, I give you a general example here. I say using the following data, calculate the forward rate on a five-year bond three years from today, which is 3R5. Three years from today, this picture tells you, this is today. Three years from today would be right here, and five-year bond would be R5, all right? And that means we are looking for five years afterward. So the total number of uh, years from now would have to be eight. Three years from today, the interest rate on a five-year bond. So what I've done here is to kind of give you a hint as to how the situation looks in the market. All right, you have a, a bunch of bonds and they are corresponding yields. And the question is, which of these yields are appropriate for the calculation you wish to perform? Well, first of all, we have identified the yield on, an, on the eighth year, on the eighth year bond on the eight-year bond, sorry, and that's bond number four. So that yield is 5.84%. That's it right there to the power of eight, eight years. And it's three or five, meaning that at least you're going to have to invest first for three years. For three years, the yield to maturity is 5.61. That's it right there for three years. And then afterward, you're going to have to figure out three or five. So if you solve for it algebraically, it's going to come out to be 5.98%. So in general, the expectations theory says that given that this eighth year, uh, this eight-year bond yield is the average of the short-term yields leading up to it, that it doesn't really matter if you invested in an eight-year bond to earn 5.84% directly, or if you chose to, if you choose to ride the yield curve, which in this example you want to go three years first. And then after three years, you go five years. It says that three R5 would be a rate such that you're going to wind up with a with the same payout out here. And that yield should be 5.98% unless something happens unexpectedly in the market. As a result, and this is a footnote, if you were to calculate this three R5, and it comes out to be as shown, 5.98, let's say that you have some magic crystal ball and you figure and you are certain that three years from today interest rates are going to be at a rate greater than 5.98 say for example a uh, seven percent any rate above 5.98 if in fact you expect a fi five-year bonds to yield seven percent then 
you need you should ride the yield curve invest first in three years at the end of which if you are fortunate that five-year bonds are paying more than 5.98 say seven percent you're gonna wind up with more payout here than you would have gotten if you were to invest directly in an eight-year bond which your neighbor might have done if on the other hand you are for sure that three years from now the rate on five-year bonds would be less than 5.98 percent let's say five percent then by golly you don't want to do this you want to go eight years directly because if you ride the yield curve three years from now the rate on a five-year bond if you are if your uh, projections are right, you're going to see it to be less than 5.98%, say 5%. And if you earn that 5%, you're going to wind up with less money than you would have gotten if you had followed your gut instincts and invested directly in an eight-year bond. And that's a wrap.